because I am a Linda Mercer of your seats and she's cranky with me. Of course, she booked me into a hotel that already had a man in my bed who I didn't want, so I could be cranky with her. All right, well, I'm glad the fact that that's all. I can't run. Okay, that's actually an interesting segue into mobile etiquette. Yeah, what do you do when a hotel checks you into a room that already has someone in the I've room? I've had that happen to me, actually. I've been on both ends of it, it should be said. I have too, actually. Yeah. It's worse, I think, when you're the person in the room. Yes, well, this man was sound asleep in bed, so I'm hoping he never knew that I came. Oh, well, there you left go. Again. I didn't turn on the Poor light. Man. I know. <laughs> Good, gotta go. Ah. <laughs> All right, moving right along. All etiquette. Right. <laughs> etiquette. <laughs> etiquette. Etiquette. All right, so, first question. It seems that for many, mobile devices have become much more than a communication tool, more a status symbol, and for some, a fashion item. Do you think this is significant, and is it more typical of a certain type of individual or an evolutionary phase? Wow. What an interesting question. Um, I think it's absolutely the case that what it is that mobile devices mean to us has changed dramatically over the last 10 years. I mean, I think it's very clear these aren't just tools of voice communication mm -hmm. anymore or text communication. There's clearly a lot more going on. But I don't think the only thing that's going on is status. I mean, it's absolutely the case that as human beings, one of the way we talk to other people is by what we wear, how we dress, what we surround ourselves by. And that mobile phones have become part of our vocabulary of talking to other people is hardly a great surprise, right? I mean, you know, it's the same with clothing and mm -hmm. cars and mm -hmm. the makeup we choose and the bags we carry. I mean, all of those things are caught up with how we talk about ourselves to others. And it's not always about status, it's also about other things, right? I think for me as a social scientist, as a researcher, what's much more interesting is the way that mobile devices have also started to function as other kinds of things. I mean, they are now a proxy for relationships. I mean, they're intimate objects. We carry them in our hands, on our bodies, on our skin, and we sleep with them under our pillows. I mean, there's this incredible way they've kind of moved into our lives. And I think there's also a way where they've changed what they do. I mean, I've been really struck recently as I've watched the way people talk about their mobile devices as these are also about a very different set of promises, right? They also promise us we'll never be bored again. They promise us we'll never be without something to do. And I think the nature of those promises are even more interesting than what they suggest about status. Mm -hmm. Great. Only 11% of respondents to the survey thought their fellow nationals exhibited excellent mobile etiquette, whereas 50% thought their own behavior was excellent. Is this apparent self-perception gap typical when it comes to judging our own behavior? <laughs> one of the lovely things about this survey, because this is the third time we've done this survey now, and one of the things that's always really striking is that it reveals this incredible sort of delta between our own self-perceptions and our perceptions of others, and where we tend to think our behavior is okay with, you know, these possible kind of, well, I did this, but I have a reason for it. We tend to judge others a little more harshly. Um, I don't think that's surprising. I think we see that across a, a range of different behaviours and our notion of our own practice, which we will always hold as closer to the ideal versus everyone else's. Um, I think what that suggests as much as anything else, though, is that this is still a space with a lot of um, fluidity. Mm -hmm. where I think these are, you know, rules in some ways, social rules that are still up for grabs. And I think as we're navigating them, we always like to imagine our own moral compass is sound. But I think the fact that we can't see that in others suggests to me this is still a place where there's a lot of kind of negotiation to be done. And as these devices evolve and new features are added and they kind of grow in their capability, this is probably going to continue to affect how people use them and what they think about their own behavior. Oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, it's no surprise, right? I mean, if you think about earlier technologies that had this level of ubiquity, electricity, television, mm -hmm. even the early days of sort of cars and the internet, it took us a long time to nav navigate all of that stuff. I mean, whether it was, you know, in my childhood in Australia, you know, did you leave the television on when other people came over or did you turn it off? Mm -hmm. How far away could you sit from it? Mm -hmm. What was the right kind of programming? You know, there's a whole lot of things and it took decades for some of those things to stabilize and I think we'll see the same with with mobile phones and with other sorts of internet enabled devices right it's going to take us a little while to sort out what the rules are and then we'll renegotiate them anyway and this is a great segue to the next question I have for you most respondents thought mobile etiquette should be regulated by a code of some sort do you think we need an imposed set of rules or should behaviors evolve organically toward an accepted set of unwritten rules mm. Well, the thing about most social rules is that they're fluid and flexible and they change over time. Now, we have things that reside 
that are long-standing kind of forms of, of social manners, some of which, you know, have their roots in things like chivalry mm -hmm. from effectively 600 years ago. Um, but we also know that things, you know, have to change and adapt because societies change and adapt and populations take on a different complexion and a different sort of set of notions about what's right and appropriate. So I think codifying things is always really tricky. Mm -hmm. By the same token, there's clearly a place for certain sorts of regulation. Think about the fact that, you know, there are government and multilateral organizations that do set standards for things like privacy or for when it's safe to use devices or about what spaces are appropriate for device use. And I think there's always a function there for that kind of regulation. But, you know, do I think there's going to be a country-specific, <laughs> the French code of mobile <laughs> etiquette? I think the answer is no, because it would be much too hard to work out what that looked like. Yep. Now, by the same token, it's absolutely going to be the case that we'll see this played out on the pages of everything from women's magazines to national newspapers and television shows, as we sort these kind of things out. And that's always where those conversations happened, as well as in our own communities and our families and our places of work. Great. Now, social media has taken the world by storm. People are engaged and they have, a, they have strong likes and dislikes oversharing of personal information and posting jokes to other people's accounts as well as tagging friends and unflattering photos have emerged as kind of the key dislikes from the survey we conducted. Do you think people behave worse on social media sites than they behave in their daily lives because of this lack of accountability? Oh, such an interesting question. There's some emerging data I've seen from some psychologists in Israel who talk about the fact that when we lie online we're not plagued by feelings of shame and guilt, but in fact we feel faintly gleeful about it. And that's a real difference from the way people feel in their offline practices, their everyday life that's not digitally intermediated. I'm not quite sure where that data fits into this kind of story, mm -hmm. but I'm always fascinated by the ways people want to um, attribute a kind of blame to social networking for social ills. Mm -hmm. And clearly social networking didn't make people bullies, it didn't make people behave inappropriately, but it's obviously tapping into something. And I'm really interested as to how that sort of plays itself out, right? But it's very clear to me that, you know, when there were photocopiers, we worked out how to make inappropriate photos of people and distribute them. Now, the range is clearly bigger, but the behavior was clearly still there. Um, I think looking at the, the survey data, the European data, I and mean, there's a couple of things that are really interesting in it to me. Um, there's clearly um, some things there that didn't turn up in the US data, which is interesting. This was not something that Americans were quite as bothered by, which I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by. I always find those kind of cultural tensions really interesting. And I'm fascinated about what it means to imagine that you can post something <laughs> online and not have people want to contribute to it. So there's a really interesting kind of... Um, tension again there emerging between this notion of sharing information but then what the consequences of the sharing are that other people will then build and contribute in ways you don't like and I think that's one of those ones that takes a little bit of time to sort itself out and I think you know takes conversations again in relationships communities families about what is the kind of appropriate and inappropriate behavior but my sense is like all these other things this is in flux I mean you know five years ago when social media new, you know, new social networking technology was first emerging we were talking about MySpace and Live Journal and Second Life, and we don't talk about those half as much as we now talk about Facebook and Twitter. And frankly, one imagines a few years from now we'll be talking about a whole different constellation of things. And we know in other parts of the world, you know, there are other sites that look really, really different QQ Zone, RenRen, Okra. And for me, I think what's going to be interesting is not so much what the behaviours look like now, but how these things continue to change and evolve as new sites and new services and new applications come into existence. Genevieve, thank you for your time. My pleasure.